Tonight on Catalyst, an epic race against time to relocate an endangered species. Hello, I'm Marianne de Macy and thanks for joining us. You may be surprised to know Australia has one of the worst extinction rates on Earth. Over the last 200 years, half of all the mammals lost on our planet forever were Australian. Now, a desperate mission is being launched to save our country's desert dwellers. Mark Horstman reports. Dawn, off the southern edge of Australia. We're on a round-the-clock race to liberate endangered animals and return them to where they belong. In 24 hours, we'll be in the red sand of a faraway desert. But our journey starts 50 kilometres out at sea to pick up an environmental refugee once common in the desert, the greater stick nest rat. Back on the mainland, they used to live right across southern Australia, but these days they're exiled to just a handful of offshore islands. And this is one of them, Reevesby Island. A conservation park about two hours from Port Lincoln. The island is grazed by Cape Barren geese, infested by death adders, and without cats or foxes, it's used as a sanctuary for hundreds of stick nest rats. Now their population is healthy enough for a small group of pioneers to emigrate. For the last week or so, Joss Bentley has been trapping as many as she can. Because the rats once existed over most of southern Australia, from western Australia across into the western part of New South Wales. So this is like a real safe house for them now? Absolutely, yep. So this is, this is sort of a store from which you can do other translocations. And he's a lucky winner. Indeed, that's a greater stick nest rat. I'll grab it out. It's named for its intriguing habit of using sticks to build family homes up to a metre high. They don't bite much and they're generally fairly docile to handle. They do stress a little bit though, you do, you do need to be a little bit careful handling them. Can this one come with us? Yeah, I think we'll take this one. It's an adult. We wouldn't, if it was a juvenile or a female with young attached, we'd leave it. But um, this one's fine to go. Stick nest rats have disappeared just about everywhere else, overwhelmed by grazing livestock and devoured by feral predators. I think we've got about 23 this will make. We'll just um, stick them in one of these little boxes for transport. I'll just chuck a bit of this salt bush and carrot in so he's got something to eat while on the journey. With the rats in their mobile homes, we're running against the clock. Ready to go. Translocations like this are a risky operation for sensitive animals. It means enduring two hours on a bumpy, noisy boat. Another two hours on a plane. Flying inland over country once inhabited by the stick nest rats, it looks like it's been skinned alive. As we near the border with New South Wales, red sand dunes of Mallee scrub and spinifex come into view. This is our destination a 65,000 hectare property called Scotia, south of Broken Hill. Not a national park, but leasehold land owned by Joss's employer, the Australian Wildlife Conservancy. The AWC is a non-government conservation charity dedicated to stopping wildlife extinction. I think we'll just let them sort of recover for an hour or so, so they can lower their heart rate and stuff. Scotia is the only place in Australia where the bush is like it was 150 years ago. The stick nest rats are the latest arrivals in a wave of endangered mammals returned here. Bridled nail-tailed wallabies, woilies or brush-tailed betongs, booties or burrowing betongs, and bilbies. Don't be surprised if you don't recognise them. They're rarely seen in the wild. All these marsupials are extinct in the rest of New South Wales and most of Australia. There's even Marla, among the last 500 left in the world. And there's one key reason why they can survive here. It's like an island. Jamie Rockliffe is responsible for border control. 
This is the uh, feral fence that AWC inherited off the previous owners. It had one major design fault. It didn't keep out cats, foxes or rabbits and it was very high maintenance. We're currently modifying the fence by doubling it in height and adding three electric wires on the top half of the outside. This will make it the longest feral exclusion fence in Australia. This is a fox track just here. Making sure Scotia remains free of rabbits, cats and foxes requires daily surveillance. What we're doing here is what we call dusting. Uh, we take this piece of mesh, drag it along behind the quad bike, which makes a nice smooth pad so we can come along the next day, check for tracks. Tracks come up quite, quite easily in this sand. When the dusting reveals tracks from a feral cat, it takes real cunning to catch it. So what we do is tie a little bit of tinsel here that will reflect in the moonlight, a little bit of what we call pongo, a bit of cat urine, pour that in there. As well, we've got what we call a fap, a field attracting phonic, which makes a noise like a cat. And the idea is to get the cat to come along and hopefully step into the funnel. And when they do, bang. What we've got there is a, uh, it's what's called a leg hold trap. It doesn't actually even break the cat's skin, so they're quite humane in that way. These traps would be checked every morning before daybreak, and we'd probably have, once we've got a cat working in an area, 40 to 50 traps set in that area. No animals are released inside the fence until Jamie's absolutely certain all the ferals have been removed. With stage one, we set a benchmark of three solid months without any feral tracks in there. Once we reach that, that benchmark, we then added six weeks. And just to be further, sure. Just to be sure. At the end of a long day for the stick nest rats, the real pressure is just starting for Joss and her colleague Natasha. Well, it's 11 o'clock at night now. This is our seventh animal. We've got 22 to do tonight. When the sun comes up in a few hours, wedge-tailed eagles and hawks will be on the hunt. We also have to make sure that these animals are out well before dawn because they need time to find some shelter before daylight. So, yeah, it's a bit of a race against time at the moment. All the animals need to be tagged and their vital statistics recorded. Weight, size, sex, breeding condition, and DNA sample. The catch is, this involves handling animals already nervous. Well, we've had one death and we've got another animal that's not looking so good. It's just stress. Stigness rats are renowned for um, being quite stressed animals, which is one of the reasons why we have to try and keep the processing time really low, like the time in the hand really low, because the longer you hold them, the greater the chances of them dying. With each passing hour, they're getting more tired, but they have to keep concentrating. Rat in the room. Rat in the room. How's the deadline looking, Joss? <laughs> when hours ago? <laughs> it's three thirty now. So it'd be nice to have it done in the next hour. It would be easier to just let the animals go, but the point is to know what happens to them. Those lucky enough to get radio collars are tracked. And every three months, more than 100 trapping stations are set up to see how the newcomers are going. How many have you released so far? Um, we've released four species, of which we've released 150 of these little guys, these whirlies. And we've released 120 bridal natar wallabies, 120 booties or burrowing bettles, and about 40 bilbies. How do you rate success? We base success rates on that we have really high survivorship of the animals we release and that they remain in good condition and that we have evidence of lots of breeding activity. And he's off. He's off. <laughs> Desert diggers like bilbies and betongs may hold the key to repairing degraded land. This is a bilby digging. It's actually one of the, the larger diggings they might make. And you can see in the bottom of it, it's collected quite a lot of litter and seed. So that litter will decompose and form a little hot spot of nutrients in there. 
these little patches that are high water and high nutrient are critical to the establishment or germination of plants. So if you start losing them, then the landscape just starts leaking species and leaking nutrients. That's why they're reintroducing the desert diggers, to stop the landscape leaking. Little bredongs are somewhere between one and two kilos each, but in a year they'll turn over something like five tonnes of soil at a minimum, which is pretty impressive. The stick nest rats may not be diggers, but as fast breeding construction workers, their role in arid landscapes is vital. Now it's time for their comeback. Tonight we've processed 22 rats. Now they're ready for release at long last. And what time is it? Uh, it's 20 past four. Inside the fence, Scotia is large enough for reintroduced animals to live as wild populations. But they remain refugees in a detention centre while cats and foxes prowl outside. This is the very first stickness rat release on Scotia. We've never released them before, so these are the uh, pioneers of reintroduction. Look, red sand. Yeah, that's a bit weird, isn't it? And what next? Another release. <laughs> <laughs> Tomorrow night. Seeing these little animals actually running around in the bush and where they haven't been for the last hundred years or so. It's fantastic to see them here again.